Thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for your attention. Uh, we look forward to a robust, interactive conversation now with John and Mario. Um, I'll kind of kick it off uh, high level, talk about value oh, investing. Oh, wait, and wait, wait. You all are down here because you wanted to see Buffett and you're in Omaha. You saw two companies earlier today uh, that are in Omaha, Valmont and Lindsay. Good management, good balance sheets, and a reasonably okay price. They're going to solve a food crisis, a water crisis, and an energy crisis. So don't ignore the fact that they were here and we listened to those management. So thanks to Dan and John. And thanks to our team at Cabelli for putting this together, uh, Max Sykes and Chris, who were already on stage, and Brett, uh, and the rest of us who are in the audience, and we'll help you uh, ask questions of John and Mario as we go through the morning here. Uh, I think I'll start, though, with maybe uh, kind of a high-level question, and I'll start with John because I'm, he's on my left. Uh, certainly from this time last year or hey, this wait time. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What does it mean he's on your left? Is this a political comment? <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead. I have I nothing mean, to know, add to that one. <laughs> we'll do politics after the session's over. Um, certainly, I think the, the markets, uh, the economy, uh, today are quite different than they were 12 months ago, let alone five years ago or 10 years ago. Uh, uh, multiples, inflation rates, easy money, certainly I think uh, is, is making our jobs more interesting. So I'm curious what your outlook is for the next three to five years, and, and what does that mean for how you're picking stocks? Well, thank you. It's a great, great, great to be here, and I always look forward to this event with Mario every year. It's just a, a real special part of my, my year, so thank you. Um, you know, for us, as you know, we are Buffett-like investors, where he always reminds us, as we know, that to, you know, to be long-term investors and not let the short-term noise affect you. you know, I have to say right now, there's so much negativity out there. There's so much negative news. So many people are talking about uh, you know, recession. Even my daughter's asking me about it, and she's an art history major, and she's convinced there's going to be a recession. But I think when everybody is so fearful and so many people are predicting the same kind of dire consequences, we think that gives you opportunity, especially in certain sectors. So we think it's a good time to invest. We're confident the next three to five years will be, will be fine, and we'll get through this difficult crisis period that we've gone through this last several months. I'll come back and ask you about those sectors uh, later. But to Mario, you've talked about crises and opportunities, and I think importantly, cycles, we, because we've seen this before, right? You've gone through multiple yeah, challenges so, with I, the I, banks. I, I, John, John and I met about 40 years ago, and we've been in touch forever, and whether he's in Chicago making money for his clients or all of us. So thank you for doing this again. Uh, your patience is amazing. Independent of that, Independent of that, Warren Buffett in his annual report says he's been investing for 80 years. So when you ask me one or two weeks or one or two months or one or two years, I'm looking at Buffett. Charlie and he are going to do this for the next 45 years. <laughs> assuming, assuming they do, okay, I started as a sell side analyst, I covered certain industries. The Dow was 1,000 45 years ago. 45 years from now, it's going to be a million. So what do I care about short term? As long as the system in this country allows money to flow to its highest return and works in that fashion, we'll be okay. Over the next year or two or three, we've got to, unfortunately, <laughs> pull back from things like an IRA. Inflation Reduction Act, when they're putting tons of money into the system. That's crazy. Uh, the Fed's trying to cut back, and the government is pushing money in. So you've got uh, political histrionics that, uh, you know, we'll get through. We've done it before. And so, Dan, the answer is you'll make money. Uh, stocks were up, several were t up today because they had, in quotes, better earnings. Uh, so several were down again. It is what it is. But how do you digest all the noise, oh, particularly with the focus the on, noise. <laughs> on, on the banks? There's no noise on the bank. The, you worry about the banks. Listen, in 1907, J.P. Morgan got all the bankers together and said, eh. You ain't leaving the room. Lock the doors until we solve the problem. And so you've had a lot of these dynamics. Now, with the banks, it's fairly simple. Buffett, Buffett, Buffett will say 
how can you borrow money short and lend it long? What do you think he does with his float? I get insurance from him, and he doesn't have to pay me my what if something goes wrong for years. So he's got long-term assets, and he's borrow and he makes the right decisions. The banks. Uh, Screwed up. The other part with the bank noise was that in 1989 or 90, a guy by the name of X, Y, and Z, and I better not use their names because who knows, uh, they created a savings and loan crisis. 1,000 banks went bust. 1,000. And as a result of that, the, <laughs> the regulators and the accountants put in something called HTM, hold to maturity which means that if you buy a mortgage for 10 years, you don't have to mark it down. You know, so what happens for four years, you have no interest rate increases, and all of a sudden the Fed goes up, and people say, I want my money. And they hit a button. You no longer have to stand online. You get a mobile app, social, they get your money back. The world changes, so what? You're worried about the wrong things. Unless you have, you have $260,000? In a bank? I would be worried if I were you. Take the 10 out. <laughs> uh, but that, uh, in the United States, $250,000 is uh, guaranteed for individuals like him. And uh, uh, anything over that, he basically has to be worried. All right. So do you, you take it out we'll, or we'll not? Get, we'll get Mario a break here. <laughs> I, I think one of the sectors that, that you've been allocating to more recently uh, has been housing. Maybe you can talk about your views and, and what you find compelling today. Well, thank you. I think, as we all know, that, that the higher interest rates uh, that have become such a problem in our economy, the housing sector has gotten hurt pretty badly. And it's been, uh, we don't own any direct housing companies. We think those are too risky for us. But what we've tried to do is the suppliers through the industry. So plumbing companies like Masco would be a favorite of ours. A company like Residio, I have a management call this afternoon with the CEO. They have the old Honeywell products that you know make sure you've got the right uh, heating and air conditioning in your home uh, when you need refurbishment or you have a new home. Um, we were on the call this week with uh, yesterday with the CEO of ADT. Uh, everyone knows the ADT name and with our, some of the challenges we have around safety in our country. You know, more and more people want to be able to make sure they have a safe home. ADT is partnered with State Farm in a great new initiative where you can get lower insurance if you've got an ADT uh, protective service. Uh, they also have partnered with Google. Stock is down more than 50%. It's been a phenomenally bad, bad uh, performer. But this morning, actually, uh, the, the CEO announced he's buying 50,000 shares, and the stock's starting to perk back up, but it's still extremely a bargain. So you can tell ADT is probably one of my, housing, my favorite housing-related uh, companies. But there's so many bargains in that, in that sector. Uh, First American Financial is another favorite of ours, uh, which does the home insurance. So we think that housing will come back. Now the interest rates are going to be stabilized again. And even if you don't get new houses, you still can benefit from the refurbishment that goes on in homes. For, and a lot of these stocks are just extraordinarily, extraordinarily cheap. So when the recovery comes, we think they're really well positioned to do extremely well. Mario, any comments on the home um, builders? I know I generally would probably use Charlie Munger's line. It's nothing to add. But basically, we have a pent-up demand in housing. So I buy a house for $400,000, and I put 20% down. I borrow 320. If I go from 3 to 6%, that extra 3%, you can calculate what the cost is per month. So you have a short-term dynamic, and the housing stocks all came down, and they've all rallied. Uh, you know, you look at Pulte Toll, uh, Lennar and all of those builders. And then you look at the manufactured housing guys like Skyline and Capco, they've all gone up. But John is right. Don't ignore the entities that supply equipment because they get some repair and remodeling and they get some other benefits. So I don't worry about that. But why'd you pick that? Why do you want to talk about housing? Of all the things you picked. I, th I think John has been an active investor. Oh, there and so you I'm go. trying to Good. give him a couple of All right, I thought you needed shelter. Opportunities to pitch his book, so. <laughs> All right, John. I think, I think one sector that, that both of you are, are actively invested in and has done quite well has been uh, sports, and specifically MSG, MSGS, MSGE, all the spins. The Sphere, I think, is your third largest holding uh, as of recently. Want to comment on what you're thinking about the world of sports? Well, one, I've, I've followed uh, 
Mario into the sport. You know, he's been so eloquent about the power of, of investing in sports franchises and companies and what's happening out there. You know, it's just a, a part of the world where things are getting better and better and better. Uh, we have the principal owner of the, of the Chicago Sky is here, Michael Alter, and uh, WNBA is doing extremely well. And you know, things are, the money flowing from television is just extraordinary coming into professional sports. We all know that. We all know the gaming dollars coming from DraftKings, et cetera, coming in. And you look at this playoffs, just this, this period now, the amount of energy in the NBA playoffs is extraordinary. You know, you turn on the television and you just see people are like thrilled to be watching these extraordinary athletes. So I think the upside is just, you know, phenomenal. Uh, it's hard to compete. You know, you can't replace the NBA or the NHL or the NFL. Um, you know, Warren always talks about you want to have those businesses you're pretty sure are going to be around 5, 10, 20 years from now. So I have a lot of confidence there. My favorite is Madison Square Garden and the Knicks. I own all three. I own Madison Square Garden Sports. Oh, own... come on. You're so full of it. You're a yes. Chicago guy. You, I... <laughs> you have to be a, LeBron, uh, a Jordan, MJ. How could you like the Knicks? Yeah, no, I like I know. The stock's my, okay. My good friend. Um, uh, well, for those that don't know it, there's a team in New York and a team in Miami on the East Coast, and there's a team in L.A. and a team in San Francisco. So they have these bi-coastal teams, and they're getting a lot of energy in the playoffs. But, yeah, I think, well, it's a great playoff series. That's, you know, yeah, you're right. Golden State and the, versus the Lakers has been phenomenal. But this Miami Knicks series, I'm hoping to get to go see a game next week in Miami. It's, it's great. But I was just going to say, the sports team is selling probably at a 50% discount. If they were to sell, uh, Jim Dolan was to sell the Knicks and the Rangers, you think you'd make a lot of money. Madison Square Garden Entertainment owns the garden itself. And, you know, it's a one-of-a-kind, world's greatest arena. There's no other arena like it in the world. And it's phenomenally well-positioned in you know, downtown New York. I still think, it's, even though I love Chicago, I think New York's the greatest city uh, in the world. And then finally, um, the Sphere in Las Vegas is this, you know, kind of like IMAX on steroids. It's got the best sound system, the best visuals. The outside of the Sphere is going to be the biggest sort of billboard in the world. And uh, Jim Dolan has spent $2 billion on it. Billion. I know. Yeah. $2 billion. Over $2 billion, <laughs> Over right. $2 billion. Yeah, it's, 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 it's over cost by a lot. But <laughs> if you go to his offices, he actually has pictures as every moment he can watch the sphere being built. It opens this fall with U2, followed by Formula One. Do you have tickets and, for us? There's I, a couple I, of people here from Las Vegas. Raise your hands. Somebody's here. And, uh, just tell us what you think of the sphere. But basically what John is saying is that MSGE is now a sphere. Is The symbol is what? SPHR, I think. Yes, SPHR, and it's 51 million shares, and the stock's around 30. And he put another business in that. that uh, a regional sports network. A regional sports network. So, you know, if this thing works, you'll get a good payoff. But it's individuals uh, that go and sing and dance there, like uh, you know those that uh, you know in the entertainment world. And this is a unique uh, example of a, uh, a theater that can accommodate fill in the blank, eighteen thousand, nineteen. Exactly. Yeah. It's exciting though. I, w I went to Burbank. They have a mini sphere. Oh, you went to the Burbank studio as well. Yeah, and just to see, like you know, you. you Look everywhere you look in the in the arena. You'll be able to you know look behind you, look above you, look. And eighteen thousand people will be in the sphere when it's built. The sound will come from everywhere. You know, the Edge, who uh, is Bono's partner uh, with U2, says it's the best sound system he's ever seen uh, in all of his history. It's just going to be something that no one's ever seen before. Hopefully, uh, we'll start getting a return on that investment this fall. Live is back, Mario. You're about, you're buying a baseball team. No, no, but if you go back to sports, uh, we're looking at, again, Man U. The stock has gone from 15 to 23, 24, back to 20. We had uh, McMahon's company with Endeavor. Uh, it's worldwide wrestling. Uh, that's kind of an interesting sport. The uh, different, but I want everyone in this room, Chris Morangi talked about it earlier when he did financial engineering. There's a team in Atlanta. The team in Atlanta is a baseball team. I want you all to buy one share of stock, it is about $35, and you can say you own a baseball team. <laughs> it's the only one you can own, and it's, uh, uh, you can, there's uh, 60 million shares at 35 is $2 billion. 
So if you and I were buying the football team in uh, Washington, D.C., we were paying for the commanders about $6.6 .6 If we bought the Denver Broncos, we'd pay five and a half, $4.6 is it? And so at some point in time, John Malone and Greg Maffei that control it will uh, sell it. So that's sad because then you won't own it, but it is what it is. So you make a little money and you'll have some fun. And you give it to somebody as a gift. Come on, Mother's Day is coming up. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get a ring if they ever win the World Series? What? Do you get a World Series ring if they win? Uh, right now they're 21 and uh, 10 and they're playing uh, Miami, I think. Are they? You don't know? Just You're a Miami guy. No. Uh, I'm a Yankees fan. I, oh, conversions. Um, so the other part, as John mentioned, uh, Madison Square Garden Sports has two teams, the Rangers and the Knicks. The stock is selling 204 and there's uh, approximately 24 million shares. But the voting stock, 4 million shares, is controlled by Dolan. So there's a possibility that he will sell LP in limited partnership interest in the team and monetize it in that fashion. There's a possibility he'll try to play basketball and not <laughs> make it. Oh, come on, you like the guy, he's okay. I wanna piggyback on some of these comments about the private market uh, transactions for sports teams and ask John about a private equity fund that your firm launched recently. Maybe you can tell us why you thought that was an attractive well, it was uh, attractive because we're getting more diversified. Ariel is 40, 40 years old, um, and uh, up until basically about a dozen years ago, we were just focused on small and mid-cap value stocks. We had all our eggs in one basket. You know, I, I believed in you know what Charlie Munger always says. You know, you don't you know the stock market shouldn't be like Noah's Ark where you own two of everything. And I believed that focus made a lot of sense. But I think we learned in 08 and 09 when the crisis hit and the stock market crashed and we lost so much. We talked to Mario and got good advice during that crisis period as a mentor and friend. And um, so we realized we needed to be more diversified. So we ended up, our international and global investment started about a dozen years ago. Uh, Mickey is one of our senior, senior portfolio managers. The international and global is here tonight. And uh, his sister, Rupa Banzali, who's on the uh, uh, round table with Mario uh, for Barron's. And so we, that was our beginnings of our diversification. So two years ago, um, Melody Hobson, who's our co-CEO and has been at Ariel for 32 years, she's on the JP Morgan Chase board. And she was having a conversation with Jamie Dimon about what to do post George Floyd's murder to try to uh, build up larger, more successful minority businesses in this country. And so she and Jamie came up with the idea of building a private equity firm to build large uh, minority businesses of scale. You know, that could be major suppliers to major corporate America. So it's been an extraordinary uh, new adventure. Uh, Melody's leading it, uh, along with a guy named Les Brun. And uh, they let me be on the advisory committee and listen to the meetings. That's about all. Excellent. So John, you started Ariel 40 years ago. Interesting. So you, uh, congratulations, by the way, on the Woodward Wilson Award from Princeton. And uh, Thank you. that was great. Uh, any, uh, go ahead, Dan, we'll do it faster. Okay. And we want questions. You have private equity on one side, and you have ETFs on the other side. Gamco, what? ETFs and private equity. Oh. Gamco's recently launched ETFs. I, the United States, the United States has, uh, needs revenues. They're going to, can they eliminate carried interest? Carried interest is where a hedge fund guy makes 20% or PE guy makes and doesn't call it W-2 income, but calls it capital gain. They've been talking about eliminating that for 30 or 40 years. The reason I start that way is there's so many little dots like that that can be changed. One of them, one of them deals with the way individuals that own mutual funds or own uh, the old fashioned mutual funds or own ETFs pay taxes. An ETF washes out the gains so I have company X called INDT, it's being taken over, it's paid 67, I got a $30 or maybe lower tax basis. I won't pay any taxes if I have an ETF. That, with, that umbrella is available to mutual funds, it's available to anybody in that industry. It's not available to taxable accounts. Another <coughs> example of where, so by leveling the playing field, 
on ETFs, they would raise a significant amount of money. So Larry, whatever the guy's name, at Vanguard and uh, Blackstone. BlackRock. Larry I know, I know. Stop. Larry BlackRock. Yeah. You know, they get the benefit of ETFs, and it's a Section 852B6, so you don't have to look it up. It's of the IRS code. So I would like to see that change. While it's not being changed, we started some ETFs because it's tax efficient. Half of the clients that go into ETFs in the United States are taxable accounts. Half of them, therefore, would have a significant benefit by, uh, by going into an ETF. If you buy a mutual fund at $10, over time, 20 or 30 years later, you get distributions, you gotta keep tack, track of your tax basis, and that is a pain in the butt. In the case of an ETF, your $10 generally stays constant, even if they're making distributions for 10, it's a 1099 that they give you what you owe uh, for dividends and interest, minus expenses. So that's why we did it. If you have questions in the audience, Raise your hand and, and we'll send it over the microphones. Mr. One quick Please. thing about mutual funds versus ETFs. I think the 1940 Act, by its very definition, is out of date. It started and it's 83 years old. And they haven't evolved the regulatory environment for the modern age to be able to be fair from a tax standpoint and a governance standpoint. It's really, uh, again, way, way out of date. It needs to be adjusted and fixed. Yeah, I, you know, you look at what Microsoft did and uh, told the individuals in London that they better get their act together with regards to regulation. Just imagine what you would say if you're unfettered about the regulation in the United States, about the Federal Trade Commission, Federal Communications Commission. They are in the dark ages. I wouldn't say that, though. <laughs> no, no, that's a comment that I'm attributing to someone else. <laughs> All right, let's start with Katie over here, and then we'll go to Lauren and back. Yeah, you got one in the front, too. Go ahead. But well, they have microphones over here, so we'll go with Katie first. This is Nick from Barron's. Mario, John, what do you do with Paramount stock? Paramount? I'm gonna go first. Okay, the, um, some of you, uh, Paramount is a uh, company that used to be called Viacom. Viacom was spun off from CBS in 1972, three, four, something like that. They merged with CBS, they unwound CBS, they merged it back, and then they uh, bought Paramount somewhere in 1994. That's the new name. Paramount is uh, having the learning curve of going into streaming. This guy, Bob Baskey, that runs it is very good. There's 650 million shares of stock. It's $17. Let's call it, to make the math simple, $20. That's $13 billion. There's debt of 12. And the reason debt is that high is that the government said they couldn't merge Simon & Schuster with someone. So when I'm paying $25 billion for this company and they're spending $18 billion on content, and some of you don't know their content, but my favorite among Yellowstone is 1883, 1923. But independent of that, I'm trying to date myself. In, uh, 1923, independent of that, uh, three years from now, I think the stock goes from 16 to 50. I think uh, Apple buys them. And uh, just think about Buffett. Why did Buffett own 91 million shares of that one and a larger amount of Apple. Does he see the dots coming down? This is a question for tomorrow. It is a question for tomorrow, and you know, I guess we feel good owning the same stock than Mario and Warren own. Uh, we think also there is a lot of asset value, not only Simon & Schuster that could be sold for over $2 billion. Uh, BET is for sale. There have been talk of selling Showtime. They have many, many assets that can be monetized to help pay, pay down debt and pay for their, their streaming content. The Paramount Library is very, very valuable. They've got all the old television shows, all the old great shows, you know, from The Godfather, Mission Impossible, uh, the Top Gun franchise. You know, Paramount is an extraordinary brand. So there's a lot of good things. It's also a global company now. Uh, they're able to stream throughout the world. You've got more eyeballs than ever that can, you know, absorb Paramount content. So we think they're really, really well positioned. Um, but it's been a very painful week, that's for sure. Uh, you know, they had to so, cut the dividend. They cut the dividend from 95 cents to a nickel. I was worried that Sherry, would not, the owner of 30 million of the 40 million voting shares, needed the money. But uh, they're saving a billion dollars over the next two years by cutting the dividend. Our clients are, you know, would have to pay a tax on the dividend. So there's a great benefit to doing that. It means that uh, a national amusements, the holding company that owns that, is in pretty decent shape, I hope. I like her, but uh, it is what it is. I'd be, I'd, be I'd be leaning in. Yes, sir. Um, Wait, does you. that answer your Paramount question? Now you want to do Warner's? Go ahead. What do you got, Steve? 
So, thank you. Um, John, I was interested in your comments about focus, and I just had a quick look at your funds. You said your main fund seems to have like 36 positions. I'd like to ask both of you, what do you think is the ideal number of stocks in a portfolio? Well, I think you know, it's, uh, both of our funds, you know, it's interesting, we both started our funds in 1986. So we've been Open-end funds. Our open-ended funds. And uh, you learn over that time what your sleep at you know, night kind of risk you're willing to take. And I found that if I had too few stocks, you know, less than 30, I wasn't comfortable. You know, having too large of positions and if something went wrong, it was just very, very hard for me. But I felt if you got over 40, you were uh, getting toward that Charlie Munger problem where you, you didn't know your names as well as you should. You couldn't be a true expert in each and every company. And the idea of being able to be focused there. So we found the sweet spot right around 35 stocks is kind of like where our, I like to be. Uh, you know, we'll let a position ride to 6% of the portfolio, and that's it. And uh, most of our major holdings are somewhere in that 4 to 4.5% when we really have true conviction and think the stock is, is very cheap. So concentrated portfolios we think are very important. There's some academic research that shows that that's the best way to invest. Uh, the uh, dean of Martin Kramer, the dean of Notre Dame Business School, talks about having high active share relatively concentrated portfolios, own them for the long run, and that's the best way to be positioned. Is that okay? No, what do you think, Mario? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I cannot buy Paramount for my small cap fund. The directors of that fund say you cannot buy a stock that has over $3 billion at the initial time of purchase. So therefore, when I start focusing on small cap there's a lot of names. Some of them are what I call alarm clock positions so that when I get, like I went to Chicago last week and I saw a company. Um, that stock is very attractive. It's good management, a good business, but I want to buy and add more at the right price and sometimes the price gets away. So you have to be patient because it'll come back. So uh, we don't have a, a logical equilibrium. I have a, accumulated knowledge on about uh, 30 industries. For example, we have an individual that ha does our airspace and commercial aviation business. He flies F-18s. He's a lieutenant <coughs> colonel in the Marine Corps. Okay, I gave him the military stocks and the defense stocks to follow. So he'll go to Farnborough and he'll go to Paris Air Show and he just loves it. And he goes and flies Mach whatever. Um, so he covers 30 or 40 companies. I will cherry pick. The common is $45 with 12 million shares, 500 million market cap. I can buy that in small cap. But I can't buy it in a fund that says you've got to buy a minimum of X. So we have a lot of different names. The good news is we have the analysts around the world. I got five in London. I got one or two in Tokyo, one or two in uh, Shanghai and uh, Hong Kong. And we cover, we don't cover countries. We don't give a something about uh, Thailand or China or anything. We care about industries. A simple example, a simple example is if you drink something, wine, water, beer, soda, anywhere in the world, we're following it. And then we do content. So we have a lot of companies and each, for, each fund is the same. I'm investing in, uh, with John because he believes and has the passion. I like to hire PhDs, passionate, hungry, and driven individuals. And John is a good example of that. And that's what all of you should be. And some of those individuals in the back, I used to call them poor, hungry, and driven. My wife says you can't do it anymore. <laughs> Katie. Uh, thank you all for coming. My name's AJ DeGrada. I'm a senior at Georgetown University. And um, I was curious, earlier when we were discussing ADT, um, do you foresee more of the value appreciation based off of like operational improvements or do you think there are larger macroeconomic uh, developments that would lead to price appreciation? I think the broader macro are um, a part of it, as I said earlier, with the challenges that we have in our society and people being fearful in their homes and you know, some of the crises that have happened uh, around the country. But I think the primary thing that we think is exciting for them is that they have a brand that is so well established. I know there's other competition that's out there, but nobody has the kind of partnerships they have with State Farm and Google, which we think will drive more demand uh, for ADT. 
uh, you know, if you're going to be able to buy an insurance product and be able to have everything at a cheaper bundled product because you have uh, your, your the ADT tied to State Farm, we think that's going to be very, very beneficial. And the technology brand with Google being able to advertise together with Google we think is powerful. The advertising budget is very, very substantial. Um, they, you know, they work really, really hard at that. So we think they're just you know, a really, really good company that's totally washed out. Um, Apollo was the private equity company that took them private and then back. John, where's the stock? Stocks is today about six six dollars. Six dollars, right? Yeah. So it's yeah. down again fifty percent. Apollo and others have you know, have valued the stock at around twelve dollars, and uh, they own Apollo owns about fifty percent. And so you feel like you got these great people that are involved. They're people who really know what they're doing. Bill Miller has also been a big big shareholder in ADT. So we're confident about the fundamental future uh, for ADT and have been buying actually buying more. Yeah, hi, Ray Cole, I'm Citadel Communications, Des Moines, Iowa. Full disclosure, Mario uh, is a business associate of 30 years and I currently have the distinct honor of serving on two of his boards. I don't have a question as much as a comment I'd like you to react to. I'm, I'm uh, fascinated every year coming over here for this weekend at how people focus on the succession plan. We heard about it in the opening panel again today. And they treat Greg Abel almost like he's an enigma. You know, he is a fellow Des Moines resident like me and having had the pleasure to know him and his wife, Andrea, beautiful family of four kids. You got a question or are you going to make a speech? I said I'm going to make a speech and you're going to react to it. I take back the part where I said I have the distinct honor of serving on his boards. <laughs> he voted against me on something. <clears throat> so here's where I'm going with this. You know, Buffett may be the Oracle of Omaha, but for us in Iowa, Greg Abel is the dynamo of Des Moines. And as you heard on the opening panel today, they, uh, Warren is not going to screw this up. And I believe that shareholders of Berkshire Hathaway are going to be thrilled with the leadership that he provides. His intellect speaks for itself, his leadership ability off the charts. More importantly, he is a kind, caring, generous person. And Berkshire Hathaway's future is in very, very good hands. Our panel this morning did not talk a lot about Greg. They may not know him as well as you two do. What do you think about the succession plan and where it's going with Greg Abel? I would say I have a, a lot of, you know, obviously, confidence in Warren's judgment. He has, he's a great reader of people. And you know, he, he knows character. He knows the good people to be involved in. And I think between Greg and, and, and Ajit, you've got two extraordinary leaders. So you've got two levels of planning there to have Greg number one. And then uh, if something happened to both of uh, Warren and Greg, you'd have Ajit there. So I think they're handling this very, very well. And I'm going to hold my stock for you know, the rest of my career, which I wish I had just bought it earlier. Yeah, I think uh, you made a good case for a local in Des Moines, Greg Abel. And so thank you for doing that. I think it just shares with everyone that there is uh, an individual or that has been selected uh, to do well. Yeah. One in the back and one in the front. Oh, Mario, uh, my name's Ron from Santa Monica. Um, I was wondering, you know, Henry Singleton was brilliant at buying his stock back when it traded a discount, selling it when it traded a premium. And I was just curious, you run a number of closed-end funds. Some traded over 50% premiums to NAV. Some yeah. traded over 20% discounts to NAV. And they're all public. They all own public assets. Wouldn't it make sense to issue as many shares as you could on your funds that trade at 50% premiums to grow the NAV and grow performance and then do the opposite on the funds that traded discounts to buy back shares? Uh, the question uh, deals with a very narrow issue dealing with closed-end funds. Uh, basically, uh, we started them in the mid-1980s. A guy by the name of Chuck Alman had started a guy in L.A. just around where you are had one. Uh, Warren Buffett was an owner of that fund. Uh, over the next last 30 or 40 years, uh, the first one we had has pays out 10% of year distribution for the last 40 odd years and uh, basically uh, sells at about a 5% premium. Our job is to grow the NAV, allow the uh, distributions to be maintained. Uh, one fund 
sells at 100% premium. There is no reason. We put a line in the statements, do not buy this fund. It sells at 100% premium. And that has been going on, I'm told, for the last 15 years. Uh, uh, clearly, if we sell stock in that fund, it will enhance the underlying NAV, because if you buy something uh, at 10 and the underlying NAV is 5, you get a, 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 a 50 cent or whatever improvement, depending on what you sell. On the other side of the coin, you asked me about a fund that's 20% discount. We are <laughs> limited under 10, uh, the rule in the United States is called what you can buy of a fund or any company under a 10B5, it allows you to buy 7,300 shares a day, unless you have a block which I'll buy from you if you want to sell it. I can have a one block <coughs> per week, you got it? You're wasting my time and you don't have a block to sell. <laughs> Katie, I'm here. Hi, um, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm joking, by the way. I, uh, thank you for being a shareholder. <laughs> Andy Chen from joking. Hong Kong, so thanks for having me. Uh, quick question, John. I noticed that in, uh, in your 13F, you have some China names, and my question is, um, you know, given Buffett is also mentioning geopolitical as one of the reasons why he sold out TSMC, I'm just wondering, how do you think about uh, investing in China, and how do you incorporate margin of safety uh, as you know as part of that in your margin of safety? And also, Mario would love to uh, hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have one of our portfolio managers here, from, from uh, leader of our international and global team, uh, Mickey. I'm I only focus uh, on domestic small and mid cap value stocks, so I really can't answer uh, about China. Can we give Mickey the mic? Yeah, from, uh, you want to help out? I mean, I don't mind giving someone else the mic that wants to talk about China. I will talk about it as well in a second. Go ahead, please. Well, th thanks for the question. And uh, I'm the uh, co-PM on the global concentrated strategy at uh, Ariel and uh, part of the international global team. Uh, the, the straightforward element of that question is, uh, I originally grew up in Mumbai in India. Uh, and I learned very early that uh, a country is not a company and a company is not a country. Uh, simplistically put, there were numerous uh, companies in India where their credit ratings were much above the sovereign ratings of the country. Uh, and that is to be expected. Uh, there are certain issues and there are certain uh, uh, modes, uh, as, as John talks about, that companies have uh, that transcend uh, certain aspects of the company, uh, of the country. And so uh, those are the elements that we look at. Uh, yes, there are geopolitical risks, uh, but some of those risks also come with advantages. If you're on the right side uh, of what the country is looking to achieve, uh, that could be an advantage. And that's the area where we skew our investments towards, the companies that are on the right side of what the country wants to achieve. Uh, and, and of course, we also look at uh, elements like good balance sheets, uh, good management track records, where we can uh, believe in the fact that the management will do the right thing uh, for the investor. And so those combined Thank allow you. us to uh, establish that margin of safety that you Thank talk you. about. Yeah, from our end, uh, when we deal with lots of companies, we like to tail management's ideas. Sometimes we fight with them. Like even Carl Icahn is a friend, but he wanted to offer a dollar and I got two dollars from him on Pet Boys. I don't think I want to do that in China. So I have a problem with regards to companies which I'm going to be an activist. Secondly, we do follow all the gambling stocks in Las Vegas. So when I look at Macau, and Macau's uh, gross gambling revenues were $40 billion, and I made that up, it could have been 38.5 in 2019, and that's coming roaring back. Uh, do I want to own Las Vegas Sands because they are not in the United States at the moment, uh, and they have a big operation in China, in Macau, and uh, you know, uh, from if I was she, he has a problem. Uh, forget about China One. It's common prosperity, but the biggest problem he has is children. So I tell all my Chinese friends, for the benefit of your country, go make love. Question over here. Hi, thanks very much. Uh, I think Sean we have time from, for two more questions, by the way. Uh, go ahead. So Sean from London. Um, just a question on the fact that large has outperformed small for a good while now. The market itself is becoming, returns this year have been very concentrated towards me mega caps and 
even the number of small mid-cap companies is really declining because they're all exiting to private equity. You know, what gets the mojo back for small and mid-cap investing? I think you know, cycles come and they go, as we all know. And what, what gets to be very popular and everyone gets convinced can only go one direction, that usually is a sign that you're getting toward, toward the top. And so these mega caps have done very, very well. And I think with the gating issue, it's going to be harder for them to grow at above average rates. Uh, they get to be large. The law, law, the law of large numbers just makes it more and more difficult. And then what happens, these smaller stocks have gotten more and more neglected. Uh, we call them orphans. And so often they're selling at cheap prices that they're not being well followed by the sell side or the buy side. So we think there's going to be a lot of bargains that will be uh, undiscovered gems that will be out there that you'll be able to find over the next couple of years. So we think it's going to be a great time for small cap uh, relative to large cap. And we're making our aerial fund even skew more small uh, than it has in a number of years because that's where we're finding the bargains and where we're finding the opportunity. Roger. Roger. Uh, John, uh, one of your holdings is uh, Charles Schwab. I was wondering if you could comment on that given what's happening in banking lately. Did you wake up this morning and look at the sign out there on a the baseball field? It said Charles Schwab. <laughs> that's, well, that's a good point. That you know their brand is, is you know is so uh, extraordinary and it's and it's everywhere. We're very confident in Charles Schwab. We've gotten to know them really well. We actually do an active ETF uh, with Charles Schwab. We've gotten to know their CIO and their leadership. We've done a lot of work uh, over the years and just think they're a world-class organization. When you do the work and you look at the uh, bank inside it, they're still gaining deposits you know, from all around the globe. It's just, I think, getting uh, thrown out with the bathwater here as so many people have been so afraid of what happened after uh, SVB, the crisis that's there. We don't think there'll be any long-term negative impact to Schwab. And because they're so well-managed, because they have the right leadership, because they have the right brand, we think it's one of those companies that really does have a moat, and they're just so well positioned in our in our ecosystem here. So, very confident about Schwab, and we're be more leaning in that direction. Another favorite in assets, the other favorite in that area is Northern Trust. We think that stock is very, very cheap, and uh, so we've really been kicking yeah, around. Yeah, but uh, just right now, the lasers of the research departments of everyone is coming out to look at what is called held to maturity accounting. Okay, and the notion is look at the HTMs of these companies and how much the, did they mark down, how much would they, if they sold everything, how much of a loss relative to the gap book and the tangible book, okay? And you gotta do that. This, the second part is if they have in that office space, I have individuals that tell me they were just in Washington, they own office buildings in various parts of the country. And it is a challenge to get financing. And so what they're doing is they're trying to figure out if they're gonna buy somebody who's turning in the mortgage. And uh, that is an ongoing challenge. And so as for a result of that, uh, we'll see. Uh, but do the homework. Just look at the HTMs for these companies. And the, the government has to do a lot more than they've been doing. I think we have time for one last question back here. And by the way, we're all available. John is going to stay for four hours. <laughs> uh, uh, but I'm, I would have played basketball, but I had to have a little challenge on the leg this morning. Le uh, yeah, a couple of days ago. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, James Eddins from Fairhope, Alabama. Um, what's your guys' thoughts on SMA versus the mutual funds versus the ETF structure? Uh, we love everybody. Well... Uh, just for those that don't know it, an SMA is a separately managed account. Separately managed account. Then there's mutual funds and there's uh, partnerships. Uh, you know, when you go fly fishing in Fairhope, why do I know Fairhope? I've been there before, but I just can't remember. Oh, I know it is. There's a guy by the name of John Martin that lived down there. You don't know him. Any of it. Uh, uh, basically, uh, you match the hatch. So when you go fly fishing, you gotta know what time the fish bite at certain times and what parts of the river you are. So if you want to do an SMA, a separately managed account, so you can see your tax basis and you can see all of those details on your own, uh, we, you know, 
you have, you have to accommodate that. If you want to do a mutual fund that's an ETF that has some tax benefits, that's fine. If you want to do a hedge fund, uh, make sure you know uh, the leverage that they use and what kind of leverage they use. And, and then if you want to buy private equity, John, uh, you closed? Yeah, we have closed it. So. Yep. How much did you raise? Uh, almost a billion five. Thank you. <laughs> there are several individuals here that are going to knock on your door to get some capital in a minute. <laughs> well, Any, tell uh, well done. comments from either of our two esteemed panelists? On SMAs? No, on anything. Closing <laughs> comments. Well, it's, well, I would just say again, it's just you know, an honor to be here today. And just really, again, as I said, look forward to this event. I think it's an exciting time in the markets. You know, I can't wait for the markets to you know, get back uh, to, you know, when weekend's over, see what Mario says, see what uh, Warren says tomorrow. And I know there'll be a lot of new and fresh ideas we'll all be able to take advantage of next week. So it's an exciting time. Yeah, but he's going to say this. People are going to ask succession. Why are you buying an oil stock? Why are you buying uh, Paramount? Why are you buying Apple? Uh, why are you doing this? What is he going to do differently? Why are you buying stock back? You know, that line in the annual report of how he addresses individuals that attack organizations that buy stock back below intrinsic value is kind of one of the best that I've read in the 20 odd years of, or 40 years or 50 that I know the guy. He calls them idiots. <laughs> With that, thank you all very much. We'll see you outside and enjoy the meetings.